Hotel family. Today, we're going to be debunking some myths that you hear from these crazy Christians about the validation of the Bible. So, let's go ahead, let's get right into it. Now, the first thing we want to know is if the Exodus actually took place. Where's the evidence, brothers? If it was in Egypt, it should be inside one of the pyramids, right? 400 kilometers south of Avaris is the tomb at Beni Hassan. It dates to 1700 BCE. Because no one has looked for evidence of the Exodus in this period, the tomb has never been linked to the biblical story. And yet, there is a perfectly preserved wall painting here that records an ancient migration into Egypt from the area of modern Israel. As in the Bible, the scene involves bearded Semites riding donkeys and bringing their families and flocks into Egypt. Like the Biblical Israelites, they are wearing multicolored tunics. The hieroglyphic inscription on this wall calls these people the Amo, God's people. Looking in the right place, during the right time, we are the first to recognize a veritable snapshot of the migration of the Biblical Israelites to Egypt. See, you've been brainwashed, brothers. See, that ain't nothing but white supremacy. See, them white supremacists done got up in your head and made you believe that those writings on the wall is actually valid. But anyway, we're going to get away from that. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let's talk about the flood. Now, if, there, if a flood actually happened, brothers, don't you know that there would be some type of evidence of the flood? A worldwide flood? But could gradual death in such a short period of time account for the fossil record we observe today? Not only that, to form a fossil, the animal or plant has to be covered quickly. And since we find billions of fossils all over the world today, something that could have killed billions of things rather quickly had to have occurred. Not to mention, we also find many fish and other marine fossils at the tops of today's mountains. So, what in the Bible could account for that? What could cause billions of dead things to be buried in rock layers rapidly laid down by water all over the earth? Well, flip to Genesis chapter 6 through 9 and you'll read the account of the global flood in Noah's day. Essentially what happened is that men were so corrupt and violent that God selected a righteous man, Noah, and his family to build a huge ark and get in it along with a pair of each land animal kind. And then God caused a worldwide flood. The water gushed up from the ground and water fell from the sky. The earth was totally covered with water and all land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures outside the ark were killed. All of them. It was a massive and destructive event. After more than a year, the waters had subsided enough that Noah and his family and the animals could get off the ark. Now, what would a worldwide flood do to the earth? Well, far too many things to discuss here, but it would have definitely totally changed the earth's terrain. It would have tossed things all around and it would have destroyed billions of plants and animals, burying them all over the earth. So based on the biblical worldview, we know that God created everything and it was perfect. But because of man's rebellion, people became corrupt and all kinds of things began to suffer and die. Because of man's continual violence and corruption, God destroyed all people and all other land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures in the world, save Noah, his family, and representatives of all land-dwelling, air-breathing animal kinds with a global catastrophic deluge. The fossil record that we observe today makes perfect sense within the biblical worldview. Now I could go on and on, but enough said. Brainwash, brothers. Don't let them white supremacists brainwash you into thinking that there was a flood that was copied from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Let's, let's, let's talk about something else. Jesus ain't nothing but a copy of Horus. Was Jesus based on the Egyptian god Horus? Many mysticists claim Jesus never existed. It was just a copy of the deity Horus. They claim there are several parallels which prove this, such as Horus was born of a virgin Isis on December 25th in a cave. A star in the east announced his birth, and he was visited by three wise men. He had an earthly father named Seb, which translates to Joseph. He was baptized by Anup the Baptizer. He had twelve disciples, he performed miracles, like walking on water, and raised El Osiris from the dead. He gave a sermon on the mount, was crucified between two thieves, buried for three days, and was resurrected. He was called Christ, Anointed One, the Way, the Truth, and the Light. Messiah, Son of Man, 
and many other titles that are applied to Jesus. So it is pretty clear the story of Jesus is just a myth copied from the deity Horus. Well, that might be true if any of these claims about Horus were in fact true. First off, Horus's mother Isis was not a virgin and was actually married to Horus's father, Osiris, and she is shown in depictions as a falcon hovering over an erect Osiris. There is no reason to think Isis was a virgin, as most Egyptologists do not even claim this. One legend even has Isis sleeping with the dead body of Osiris, and Horus was conceived from that. So there is no reason to think Horus was born of a virgin. There is also no evidence Horus was born in a cave, let alone a manger, and there is no evidence of a star in the east or three wise men. Let's also remember in the Gospels, it doesn't say three wise men visited Jesus. It says an untold amount of magi visited Christ after his birth, but it never says three. Jesus was never confirmed to have been born on December 25th. It was just an estimate based on early calculations, but never confirmed or written in the New Testament. Seb was never said to be Horus's earthly father. In fact, Seb was a god, the god of the earth, or the earth itself, and there is no linguistic connection to the name of Joseph. Some references say Seb was the father of Osiris, not Horus. There is no Egyptian scholar who has ever heard of Anup the Baptizer. This was just made up out of thin air by mysticists. Horus was never said to have 12 disciples. Some legends say he had four, and some just say he had an untold amount. Horus did perform miracles, but that would be expected from any deity. As for walking on water, there is no evidence of this. He also didn't raise Osiris from the dead. Osiris didn't come back to life, but remained in the underworld to serve as god of the dead. Plus, there is no evidence Osiris was ever referred to with the prefix El. This is just not true in Egyptian mythology. There is no evidence Horus gave a sermon on the mount, no evidence he was crucified, let alone between two thieves, no evidence he was buried, and no evidence he was resurrected. He was never called Christ, Anointed One, the Way, the Truth, and the Light, or any of these titles commonly associated with Jesus. Modern mysticists have simply lied or lack any ability to do accurate research because all of these supposed claims about Horus simply do not exist in Egyptian mythology. And until these mysticists provide actual original source evidence for these claims, there is no reason to believe them. So since that is the case, there is no evidence Jesus was a myth based on Horus. Okay, you know about a copy of Mithras. Was Jesus based on the Persian god Mithra? Christ Mithras will claim Jesus never existed and was just a copy of Mithra because Mithra was born of a virgin on December 25th. He was a traveling teacher and performed miracles. He had 12 disciples. He sacrificed himself for world peace, was buried in a tomb and resurrected three days later on Easter morning. His followers were promised immortality. He was called the Good Shepherd, Savior, Redeemer, the Way, the Truth, and the Light. His holy day was Sunday, and his followers partook in the Lord's Supper every week. So do we have proof that Jesus was a mythic copy of the god Mithra? Well, for that to even be remotely true, some of this nonsense would have to be factually correct. And in fact, it is not. First, there are actually three different versions of Mithra, and none of them match Christianity. Most who try to claim this tend to think the Mithra of the Roman cult is where Jesus came from. But this mystical religion surrounding Mithra didn't leave any writings behind for us to know what they believe. So we have to piece most of it together from secondhand sources and inscriptions. First, it is unlikely Mithra was born of a virgin. All sources indicate the Roman version was born out of a rock. This is also confirmed by Commodianus. As for December 25th, Roger Beck states this is just absolutely wrong. In truth, the only evidence for it is the celebration of the birthday of Invictus on that dating calendar of Philo Calus. Invictus is of course Sol Invictus, Aurelian sun god. It does not follow that a different, earlier and unofficial sun god, Sol Invictus Mithras, was necessarily, or even probably, born on that day too. There is no evidence Mithra was ever called a traveling teacher. As for performing miracles, such a task was said of just about every deity and is way too general to form any parallel. There is no evidence Mithra had 12 disciples in any version. In the Persian or Iranian version, he had one companion, who was Varuna. And in the Roman version, he only had two companions. The idea that Mithra had 12 disciples is taken from this image of Mithra, slaying of the bull, where he is surrounded by 12 figures. But these are not disciples. They are the signs of the zodiac. 
Plus, this inscription postdates Christianity, so it cannot mean any type of dependency. There is no evidence Mithra sacrificed himself for world peace, and Christ Mithras have yet to provide any evidence. As for his burial and resurrection, this is just an outright modern lie. There is no indication in any version of Mithra that he died, let alone was buried and resurrected. The Mithra cult probably did promise their followers immortality, because that was customary in almost all religions, and is way too general to force any type of real parallel. Mithra was never called the Good Shepherd, Savior, Redeemer, the Way, the Truth, and the Light, or any common title that is applied to Christ. These are just outright lies. Now it is true that Mithra's holy day was on Sunday, but given there are only seven days in a week, and the first day of the week was significant for many cultures, it is hardly evidence of borrowing. Plus, we should also note, most of our knowledge on the Mithra cult comes from after the time of Jesus. So if there was borrowing, it is more probable it was the other way around, meaning the Mithra cult stole from Christians. Finally, there is no evidence of a Lord's Supper in the Mithra cult. Any reference to this comes from very late medieval texts that cannot be trusted. So since that is the case, there is no evidence Jesus was just a myth based on Mithra. What about Serapis? Was Jesus based on the Egyptian god Serapis? Many mysticists doubt Jesus ever existed and believe he was copied from the Greek and Egyptian god Serapis because Serapis was called the Good Shepherd. He was considered a healer and a miracle worker. Christianity took the Serapin practices of using lights, bells, processions, and music. They look identical in depictions. Serapis was a sacrificial bull, and Christ was a sacrificial lamb. He was annually sacrificed for the sins of Egypt. And there is a letter from the Emperor Hadrian, which says the worshippers of Serapis were called Christians and had bishops of Christ. So with that, do we have evidence Jesus was a copy of the god Serapis? Well, not really, and the scholarship behind this reveals this is all nonsense. First, I can find absolutely no evidence in ancient records. Serapis was ever called the Good Shepherd. The second one, of course, is too general since all deities are said to do this. The third one has no evidence of any direct connections. Using things like music and lights were used for almost all deities, and this is far too general. We have no evidence that Christian usage of these things was identical to the worship of Serapis. So unless we can get any details which show identical worship or direct dependence, this one has no evidence. To claim they look identical is absurd. Almost all men of that period had similar hair and beards, mainly because that was the customary way for men to look, and they didn't have cheap razors you could buy at the grocery store. Only the wealthy Roman elite could afford to keep themselves clean-shaven. By this logic, almost every man must be a copy of Serapis if he has a beard. Since a lamb and a bull have no real connection, the issue is over whether or not they are both sacrificed in the same way. And the evidence shows this is nonsense as well. Jesus was willingly sacrificed for the sins of the world, whereas Serapis had nothing like this. In truth, Serapis was a blended deity, the combination of Osiris and Apis. Apis was a sacred bull, worshipped in Memphis, who was said to have died and then in the underworld became one with Osiris to become Osarapis, which was Serapis in the Hellenistic period of Egypt. This is nothing like the story of Jesus, and vague similarities don't cut it. The next one is strange. Jesus was not annually sacrificed. I think mysticists are confusing the celebration of Easter, where we remember Jesus' victory over sin and death, and assuming it is where Jesus has to die again every year. This is an absolutely ridiculous way to look at Christianity, and it is a joke to assume this is remotely true. The final one is the most used to argue for myth borrowing. People like Ray Hagens and Robert Taylor will claim there is an early letter written by the Emperor Hadrian which says a group in Egypt called themselves Christians and worshipped Serapis. They claim this is clear evidence Christianity evolved from Serapis worship. However, there are so many problems with this supposed letter. First, even if the letter was legitimate, it would date to 134 AD, which is long after Christianity started, and it is equally likely Serapis worshippers borrowed from Christians who were spreading the gospel in that region. We already know Serapis worshippers were prone to syncretism, so if the letter was authentic, it would be more likely the Serapis cult borrowed from Christians. However, the letter is most likely a forgery, and that is how most scholars recognize it. 
The letter is found in a late 4th century collection of forged biographies called the Historia Augusta. The reason scholars think this is because it is filled with anachronisms. And it is pretty obvious in the Serapis letter itself. So since that is the case, there is no evidence Jesus was just a myth based on Serapis. All right, so whatever, whatever these white supremacists say, y'all gonna believe it, whatever. But anyway, what about the Hittites? Now, remember there was these people in the Bible named the Hittites. So if the Hittites actually existed, family, then we would have a lot of evidence of these Hittites, wouldn't we? I'm here in the heart of Istanbul, which is frequently known as the cradle of civilization. But in fact, the first politically united empire in Anatolia, which is really the largest part of modern day Turkey, was the Hittite Empire. Now, obviously, they never came to Istanbul. It didn't exist at the time, but now some of their greatest treasures reside here. Istanbul is a city of contrast that straddles Asia in the east and Europe on the west. Amid the hustle and bustle, Tessa is heading to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, a sanctuary of calm that houses what many consider to be one of the most important documents ever written. It's the Treaty of Kadesh, written 16 years after the great battle between the Hittite and Egyptian empires. Tessa is with Professor Ali Dincho, one of the world's leading Hittite scholars, to find out more. Professor Dincho, this is the, the Kadesh Treaty. But I wonder, why was it signed so much later than the battle itself? Uh, only after Hattusheli uh, uh, stabilized the uh, political uh, events in uh, Anatolia, he could um, make a treaty with Egypt. I see. So in other words, Hattusheli had to make sure he was strong at home before he could look outwards. Yes. Did the treaty actually work? Well, yes, because uh, no aggression uh, has happened after the uh, after the treaty until the fall of the Hittite Empire. Still, okay, never mind. Maybe they got that right. We don't know. Whoever, maybe they wrote the Bible after they found out that there was these people named the Hittites. Whatever, you know, it's all allegory. Whatever, white supremacists been writing that book. So, and they've been writing your history. So anyway, let's go to the next issue that we got. Jesus never existed, brothers. See, this is what I'm trying to tell you. See, if Jesus existed, then people wouldn't be talking about him, right? Or, or people would be talking about him. People would be talking about Jesus, but how come no atheists? Atheists ain't got no, or, or agnostics or, or, or any uh, secular scholars. They all say that Jesus didn't exist. We have more evidence for Jesus than we have for almost anybody from his time period. So, I mean... You know, I'm not saying this as a believer. I'm not a believer, but as a historian, I'm just saying that you, that you you can't just kind of dismiss it and say, well, you know, we don't know. I mean, you have to look at the evidence. So there is, there is hard evidence, I think. I'm, okay. I mean, I'm, okay. Okay. Whatever. That's that's a white man. Another white supremacist brother. Plus, white supremacist family don't don't believe in the white supremacists. Okay. Now this this my family. If there was evidence that Pontius Pilate existed, family, then I'll believe in that Bible. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are here in Caesarea, right here on the coast, as you can see, in the land of Israel. And right here, I have the uh, Pontius Pilate stone. This is a replica, of course. The original is in the Israel Museum. This, of course, was found uh, here in Caesarea. If I remember correctly, my archaeology professor actually was on the dig where they found this. Uh, but this actually talks about Pontius Pilate. And you can read it here. You know, Pontius Pilate, Roman prefect of, of uh, uh, Judea, was uh, presiding here during the trial of Christ, of course, as you can read in the book of uh, Matthew 27 and the other Gospels. And right here, you can read the inscription. Tiberium Pontius Pilatus, prefect of Judea, is actually what it says in English. But this is one of the evidences that shows that Pontius Pilate was an actual historical individual who was here during the time of Christ. You may brainwash family. 